Welcome to Wednesday night. Glad you're here. Uh, there might be more coming in, maybe a little bit later. Um, but uh, it's been a uh, it's been a challenge over the last few days. But I think what I, I said something Sunday, and I was, t- I was telling some people today. We went to a meeting today about BGMC and Speed the Light and stuff, and I was telling um, I was telling R- Pastor Russell from Macon that uh, you know I think you know we always hear the hands and feet of Jesus, but I think I've seen the heart of Jesus these last few days in this community, um, and it's been a, it's been amazing. Matter of fact, yesterday I went to eat lunch up here at the Mexican place, and the, the place down the or maybe it was Monday down the end, the chicken shack, they are normally closed on Mondays. But there were Salvation Army vans out there, and they were loading them up with food that they've been cooking. So everybody's doing what they can. And um, if you think you haven't done anything, if you've prayed, believe me, you've done something. And that's, you know, it's just been amazing. So I'm glad you're here. Um, I asked somebody, somebody asked me the other day, they said, do you think we'll ever get back to normal? I said, no, because you're going to go down the road in a year from now, and you're going to see where something used to be, but it's not going to be normal to you because it's not there anymore. So, uh, but normal, I don't know if I want normal. (laughs) I don't know if I want normal. I think I want whatever I can, whatever God wants to do, right? So. But anyway, if you'll stand with me, we're going to pray. We're going to get into worship. And um, <clears throat> we're going to uh, uh, just, just, just get lost for, you know, today. I started something today on Wednesday in the Word that I'm going to be doing from now on. Um, I open up now with a, with a worship song. And I, I opened up today with an old hymn, called, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. And uh, we used to sing that song at our church just I mean, like, at least three times a month. I mean, you know, three Sundays out of the month, we're going to sing that song at least once. But um, so it's just something I, I just, I don't know, I just, something's, something's going on with worship in my life right now. And I just, but I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and to serve and to, to be fed your word, to worship you for who you are Lord not for what you can do but just for who you are I don't want to read I don't want to seek your hand anymore I want to seek your face I want to seek you for who you are now father be with us meet us here Lord bless this place as we come together and we gather in your name and we ask it all in Jesus name amen
Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you tonight. We give you praise and glory and honor. We thank you, Lord. We do bow down. We fall down at your feet. We worship you and we cry, holy, holy, holy is your name. Father, we're so grateful, so thankful. We are such blessed people because of your love that you've bestowed upon us. And Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that, that our worship has been a sweet sound and a sweet savor that has filled the heaven to capacity. And Lord, that you are honored by, our, by our, our worship and our hearts just crying out to you. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 1996, when we got saved, somebody gave us a CD called Wow Worship. That song was on it by Don Moen. And uh, I think we wore that CD out within the first three weeks we had it. I mean, it was our, it was our first actually original Christian CD because everything else we had was Leonard Skinner, ACDC, Wally Hatchet, you know. Those were mine. <laughs> she had country stuff, but, you know. You know, they always talked about, you know, heard over the years that if you play a rock and roll song backwards, it's demonic. I never tried it, but I did a country song, and the guy got his truck back, his wife came back, his dog came back, and his, got his house back. So, pretty cool, right? Acts 3, verses 1 through 11. We're going to read that, but we're not going to get that far, but we're going to read it. Acts 3. Now, Peter and John, are you there? I need to let you get there, I guess. You there? Now, Peter and John went up together to his temple, to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Ooh, I like that. The ninth hour, the hour of prayer. A man lame from his birth was, was being carried, whom people placed daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful, to ask for alms and for those who entered the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter, gazing at him, John, with John, he said, look at us. See, he paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I give you, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus, of Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the hand, by the right hand, and he, and he raised him up. Immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. Jumping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew that it was, the, that was he who set it for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And that they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. We'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> we'll stop there at verse 10. But I love this story. I, I, I read this so, many, so often sometimes just to sit down and read it. Um, there's commentaries on it. There's other Bibles that have a breakdown of it. But we're going to learn some things from this particular story, and we'll we'll get to other verses. But we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna find out from here that this was a very important event. Um, Pentecost had just been poured out; three thousand were added to the church, and now here Peter and John is going to the temple to pray, as it was custom to do, especially at this particular time. And here's this man who's always brought by somebody and left at the gate. And he was brought, it's funny to me that he was brought to the gate beautiful that led to the temple. I think he knew where his help was coming from. So, that might be a different sermon, a different day, a different time. But, so certainly the events of this day show us the blessedness of public worship. At the appointed hour of prayer, Peter and John came to the appointed place to, to worship God. Though the lame man came only for carnal reasons, he was there for money, he was there for a handout. Still, he came to the place where his needs were most likely to
to be met, and that was the house of God. It's interesting they could have set this man anywhere on the road, but they set him right by the gate that, walked, that led into the temple. At the time they set him there was the time that everybody was going to pray. There's going to be some folks, Daniel, going in and out of that place. I'm going to make some money today. It might have been his thought. But he was, there, he was there for a corner reason to get a necessity that he needed was money and, and alms and whatever else could be given. But he wound up getting something more than he, bought, than he ever thought about. There God made himself known both to his servants and to a certain lame man from his mother's womb. Let every needy soul cherish the house of God. Attend the assembly of worship and give thanks to God for the privilege of doing so. Psalms 122, verse 1. It's in the assembly of God's saints that needy sinners have hope of meeting a mighty Savior. People don't think church is necessary. I don't have to go to church. You know, going to church don't make me a Christian. Sitting in my garage don't make me a car either. Come on. If it did, I'd have been a Corvette a long time ago. But listen, people, you know, and I'm, I know we're, we're actually doing this, and, I, and, I, and we're, we were actually doing it. We were doing live stream before COVID came, but It's become somebody's, the church has made it easy to stay out of church. Hmm, they're going to do it live. I'll just stay home and watch it. There's nothing like being in the house of God with the fellowship of God's people, around God's people. And I'm not saying God can't meet you in your living room because he can. And I'm not, but if we get accustomed to being away from the house of God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to ever get back to the house of God. Um, this passage also shows us an example of Christian charity and kindness. Though Peter and John had no money in their pockets, they did not ignore this man's miserable plight and condition. You know, sometimes a lot of people, you know, somebody needs some financial need and it's like they just turn their head to it because, you know, I'm, you know, I ain't going to give you no money. It's, it's still, we need to recognize the condition or, or, or where the person's at. Um, I understand that today there's a lot of scam going on. Um, there's been report after report, different cities, I don't know about here, but different cities, larger cities, that some people that stand on the side of the road and ask for money make more money than some guys in corporations. And one guy, one guy was offered a job. They did an interview with him. He was offered a job from a guy that owned a company, very lucrative company, and was going to pay him very well. And he said, how much are you going to pay me? And he told him, he said, I make more than that doing what I'm doing. Why do I want to go work for it? Now, not everybody's that way. I get that. I know that. But, and I'm not sitting here telling you that you got to stop by everybody you see on the side of the road and give them money. I'm not saying that. You let discernment set in, you pray, and you let the Holy Spirit speak to you. So here's a guy in Griffin that's usually at uh, Lowe's. I've seen him at Walmart. And he's got a sign that says, yesterday I worked for food. And he flips it over and says, today is Bud Light. Huh? You seen him? I want to stop and say, dude, you might want to turn that back around because you ain't going to get nothing from with that. But who knows? He may have been loaded up. I don't know. He may have been walking down the road with a buggy full of beer. Who knows? Huh? He wasn't lying. So I worked yesterday. Today I want to drink. (laughs) But what I'm saying is that this guy was sitting here at, at all times. Every time, I don't know if it was always at the ninth hour for prayer time, but he was always at this same gate because people went in and out of this gate to go into the temple. And it's, 
And somebody, I've heard two stories about this. They were kind of comical stories. One said that you knew John and Peter were Pentecostal pastors because they didn't have any money. The other one is you knew that he, why would he be taken to the church because the church people was not going to give him any money. I don't know about that. But here's the deal. They did, they recognized his condition. And we ought to always do what we can to relieve the sufferings of others. We are not here, we are not saved to benefit ourselves. We're saved to benefit others. I put something on Facebook the other day and I thought I was going to get blasted. We don't adjust to God's ways. I mean, to, to, God don't adjust to my ways, I adjust to his. He didn't save me to come and sit on this seat right here and just sit here and say, okay, bless me if you can. He saved me to be a blessing to others. I tell people all the time, you don't, you're, not blessed to be, you're not blessed to be blessed, you're blessed to be a blessing. When Malachi says, I'll give you enough, if you give me your tithes and offerings, I'll give you enough to put it, winds of heaven, but you won't have enough to store it. It's not telling you to hold on to it. It's telling you you can't store it because you're going to give it out as fast as you get it. I believe God works that way. I believe we're blessed to bless others, and as we bless others, he blesses us again to bless others. It's just a continuation. And I believe that's, that's, how, that's how the kingdom works. The purpose of this miracle is to demonstrate the power of the risen, exalted Christ to save sinners. This is the interpretation that Peter himself gave of the miracle. The healing of this crippled beggar is a beautiful picture of God's effectual saving grace in Christ. In the next 11 verses, the Spirit of God teaches us five important lessons. Now, I know we read 10, but we'll read the next one in a minute. But First of all is this, number one, lesson one. All men are spiritually I don't even know what that word is. What's that word? Oh, come up here and look at it. What's that word? Well, that's the word of God. <laughs> Impotent. Impotent, okay. That's what, it didn't look right. I think I typed it wrong. I think I typed it wrong. Nature. Nature. All men are spiritually impotent by nature. This, this means man's impotence was not the result of an accident or disease. It was an effect of birth. Look at me, don't mess my Bible up. That's what you get for throwing the word, right? So, he was born in this helpless condition. This is our condition by nature, not physically, but spiritually. Our hearts are plagued with the incurable disease of sin. Spiritually, our legs are broken, our hands are withered, and our eyes are blind, and our ears are deaf. All men by nature are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. All men by nature are dead in trespasses and sins. So through, the, through this nature, this natural man's spiritual impotence, that he is altogether without the ability to help himself. Been there and tried to do that. All the children of Adam are born totally depraved because his heart is evil and no man can or will come to Christ and be saved. Wait a minute. No man can or will come to Christ and be saved. He has either the desire nor the ability to do so. God must do a work of grace in the heart before any sinner will ever come to Christ in faith. It's not something that's just naturally done. It's not something that's just figured out and done. It, it ha there has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what draws people to Christ through conviction and then leads them to repentance. But there has to be a work of grace in the heart of any sinner that will come to Christ in faith. And if God does a work of grace in his heart, 
the sinner will come to Christ. John 6, 46, 45, and Psalms 65, 4, and 110, 3. Those three verses will kind of show you that. Because he was crippled, he was unable to work for a living. He spent his days begging. That's all he knew, that's all he could do. That is our condition, too. Before God, we are poor, helpless beggars. Look, this is not being ugly or crucial or critical about people, but the sinful life is a, it's, it's crippling. It, it basically, it says this, a sinful person is dead. Because Christ gives life and life more abundantly, so without Christ... I'm a walking dead man. Walking dead ain't got nothing. Jesus knew that before they ever thought of that show. So listen, his grace must work before it happens. We're beggars. We're poor. We have no ability to earn anything from God except death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die. But Jesus walked in the courtroom and said, Your Honor, I'll take that for them. Whew, man. I love that story. We have no claim upon his mercy. Oh, wow. Deb, great song tonight. All we can do is fall before him and beg for grace. Luke 18, verse 13. All we can do is fall before him and beg for grace. Matthew Henry said this. Matthew Henry writes commentaries. He, those that need and cannot work must not be ashamed to beg. Did you hear that? Those that need and cannot work must not be ashamed to beg. This beggar was a chosen object of divine mercy. Yes, it was put by this gate probably regularly. But just so happened, he was put there on this particular moment when two men who just left a Pentecostal revival just so happened was walking into the temple. He was both poor and helpless, but there were many others in that condition around that temple. Luke tells us that this man was a certain man. God had chosen him and was determined to be gracious to him. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14, you can see the graciousness of God. But he was chosen by God. Don't know if he was a believer. Don't know if he understood. Don't know if he worshipped. Don't know if he was, don't know. Just know he was outside the gate. He was begging for help. And it was all divine appointment by God, but God's put him there at this particular time. Providence had made him poor and helpless and put him in the place where grace would be found. Number two. We are given, you don't have to write this part, but a stark reminder that religion without Christ is a mockery to the souls of men. And I'll kind of, you can write it like that. Mark, uh, uh, religion without Christ is a marker to the souls of men. I'll say this. I don't think you can have religion and Christ. Jesus had a problem with the religious people. They, crucif they crucified him. Jesus was relational. Religion is... It's tradition, which I, some tradition's okay, but some tradition needs to go. Um, if you tell me that I have to follow certain guidelines to be part of your church, then you are a cult. You're not a church. Because that keeps me in captivity where Jesus wants to set me free from that stuff. 
So there stood the temple with its breathtaking splendor. Josephus tells us that it was made of solid white polished marble, this temple. Solid white polished marble. The beautiful gate was made of fine Corinthian gold. This is a mega church, y'all. I'm kidding. With the midday sun shining upon it, it was almost blinding with brilliance. The Jews were very proud of their temple. But it was, <laughs> oh, this next phrase. The Jews were very proud of this polished, marble, gold-gated temple. But it was an empty, desolate place. There may be people there on Sunday, but I promise you it's empty and desolate. In some places. Because most likely they're there because of one another. They're not there because of Christ. And if he's not in the building, there's no power, there's no anointing, there's no breakthrough, there's no healing, there's no salvation, there's no deliverance. They're proud of it. God had left it for them. The glory of God had departed from it, though. There was nothing and no one connected with the temple that could be of any real benefit to the poor, the helpless beggar, its splendor riches, and the beauty only mocked him. What a sad picture of modern religion. There is a religion, there is in religion much to impress the flesh. That's what it feeds. It feeds your ego. It makes you feel like you are somebody when you are not. It makes you feel like you can do whatever you can do, but you can only do what, my Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, not in my own being. You know, Zechariah says, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So if he's not there, obviously I'm not going to be able to do what I, supposed to, I think I can do. It impresses the flesh. It impresses wealth. It influences talent, entertainment, and rituals and ceremonies to soothe the conscience. A form of godliness, but no power. Let me jump off just a second. In Timothy... When Paul wrote the letter to Timothy and he said in the last days there'll be perilous times and he goes through the list of what people will be, lovers of money, haters of God, this, all this despiteful and all these things. And he gets to the part of that verse and he says they'll have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Everybody reads that verse and goes, wow, that's in the world today. Folks, he's talking to the church. That letter he's writing to Timothy, you can't have a form of godliness if you're worldly. There can't be a form of God. There's not a form of godliness in you. If you're a sinner living in the world, there's not a form of godliness in you. I'm not saying you're, that you don't believe in God, but there's, you don't have a form of godliness. If you're going through these things that they're doing, and, and this religious thing that's been, that, that we're talking about here, this entertainment, this wealth, this flesh stuff that's satisfying the flesh, the influence, the entertainment. Churches today don't worship God. They come and try to entertain God. I Man, I should have preached this on a Sunday. Whew. There's no power in what they're doing. If there's no power, there's no gospel. If there's no gospel, there's no grace. If there's no grace, there's no Christ. If there's no Christ, there's no life. It's a mockery to God and to the souls of men. Thirdly, when God intends to save a sinner, he always uses certain means. And that's covered in verses 1 through 5 that we read. We, where he pleased to do so, the sovereign, almighty God could perform his works 
of mercy without the use of means. Can I tell you something? I don't want to bust anybody's bubble. I don't want to break your heart. I don't want to disappoint you. God don't need us, but he wants us. He don't need me, but he sent his son to die for me. God can do whatever God wants to do. If this world needs to end right now, he could end it just by speaking it. He spoke it into existence. It's not that God needs me, it's God wants me. It's not that, that God can't do nothing without me, but he does depend on me. Does that do anything? Man, that just that gets me excited. So, he could do things without any kind of means, but this is, not how, this is not his pleasure. It's not how God chooses to work. God consents to honor us by allowing us to be instruments in his hands by which he performs his work of mercy toward his chosen. You know what we really are? We're vessels. This is a vessel. It's about to be an empty vessel, but it's a vessel. We're vessels. He's constantly pouring into us so that we can pour out. He's constantly pouring into me so I can be used by him so he can get glory. It's not for me to be known, it's for him to be known. So, he doesn't, he just chooses to use vessels and instruments to perform what he wants to do. He who raised Lazarus from the dead could if easily remove the stone from the tomb, but he allowed and commanded men to do what they could do, saying, Take ye away the stone. He could have removed that stone. But he let men do it. So men could actually see the evidence when they pulled the stone away. Even so, this poor lame beggar was healed by the power of God alone. It was not Peter and John. They were the vessels that spoke it. Peter makes, this, makes that abundantly clear. But three things had to be done by, the, by men before he could be healed, okay? Before the beggar could be healed, there were three things that, men, that these men had to do. Peter and John came to the temple to preach the gospel of Christ. This man's friends brought him to the temple, the place where he was most hopeful of finding mercy. So he, some men had to come to preach, to preach the gospel, and somebody had to get him there. Number three is, it's kind of lengthy. I don't know if you'll be able to take notes on this, but this man did what God's servants told him to do. We know that God's purpose will never fail. This man had to be healed on this occasion. Do we, do we really believe that Every day is already ordained by God. Do we believe that God knows what's going to happen? Do we believe that God knew what was going to happen last Thursday? Do we believe that we know that God knows what's going to happen tomorrow? He ordained this. He pre, I don't say I'm predestined, but he, this, God had purposed this event to take place. When and where and how it did. The day you went to an altar and repented and gave your life to Christ, that day was already etched in stone because God already knew it was going to happen. You may not have known it, but he did. This is, this is, this gets so deep to to, to know the levels of what, did God purpose this? This man's healing was purposed before the foundation of the world. God knew there was going to be a lame man that Peter and John was going to encounter. There was a man in the Bible, in the New Testament, that wanted to see Jesus. He was a tax collector. He had a lot of money, but he was real short. I say, I don't know if he was that short, but his name was Zacchaeus. 
You know what Zacchaeus did, right? He knew the crowd was there. It was a lot of people. He wanted to actually see Jesus himself. So he couldn't see because people like Daniel was in front of him. So what did he do? He did what? He climbed a tree so what? So he could see Jesus. That tree was planted long before he was ever born, y'all. <laughs> Just wanted you to know it was his purpose. That was for him for that day, for that moment. It was destined. God said, he's going to be here. I'm going to get this tree planted. And when Zacchaeus comes, he's going to be able to have dinner with Jesus at his house. Tell me he don't lay our steps out. Whew. I need to preach this. I'm going to preach this one Sunday. Y'all just have to stay home. No, y'all can come here again. Listen, if Peter and John had not obeyed the Lord and gone to preach the gospel, this man's friends had not brought him to the temple, or if this man himself had refused to obey the voice of God's servants, he would never have been healed. It took the use of Peter and John to go preach. It took the purpose of his friends to get him to the gate, and it took his responsibility. See, he had a responsibility as well to obey what Peter and John said, rise up and walk. He had never been healed. Number four, this, the healing of this man shows this. The Lord Jesus Christ is, almighty, is an almighty, all-sufficient Savior. It's a picture of true conversion. You have seen how this man's body had been healed, even by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in this way that your soul must be saved. For there is no, there is no other power that can affect such a change within you, a change from weakness to strength, from death to life. The Bible says there's no other name by which man can be saved. Jesus told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. Oprah said there's, more way, there's many ways to heaven. Oprah's wrong. There's one, and his name's Jesus. Yeah, I said her name because it's been, it's been all over. It's old news, but it's been out there. Christ is able to save. And I want to tell you, in 2023, he's going to still save. By the mere ex exercise of his sovereign will, sin is subdued. Guilt is removed. The dead life, bloodthirsty lions are made to be lambs. Or the dead live, I'm sorry. Um, and wretched sinners are made new creatures in him. Christ on the tree has put away sin. Christ on the throne is able to save. Amen. Number five. The gospel of Christ is always effectual. This is verses 8 through 11. It's always, it always accomplishes its intended purpose. I'm not going to read it, but Isaiah 55, 10, 11 says, my word will not return to me void. It will accomplish all it was set out to do. When God speaks a word through his word, through the written word, through the spoken word, through a prophetic word, through whatever kind of word, if it's from him, it's going to accomplish what he said. If he said your children will be saved, your children's going to be saved. Come on now. He can't go back on his word. He can't break his word, and it will accomplish what it set out to do. It offers salvation and eternal life to all who come. I'm still getting my shirts. I've already talked to a guy. I'm getting my shirts printed up. I'm a whosoever. And I'm going to put it, and I'm getting on the back. I'm just going to be just on the back. It's going to have that, the scripture verse. It's going to have New Life Church at the bottom of it, and we're not going to have anything on the front. So it's just going to say, I'm a whosoever. And if somebody says, what does that mean? Well, sit down for a minute. Let me tell you what it means. And before they leave, they're going to be a whosoever. <laughs> Woo! It's time to witness, folks. It's time to win people to Jesus. 
It's the means by which God and the Holy Spirit brings chosen sinners to Christ. And it gives praise, honor, and glory to God for his saving goodness. Wow. That's amazing. I believe I got that far, but I did. So listen. Let me borrow your pen. Let me mark this. If I don't mark it, though, I'll repeat what I did today, next week. Next week, we'll, we'll finish. We'll go through verses 11 through 26. Then there's a different, there's a different breakdown of actually verses 14 and 15. Um, I'll, I'll break those down after we finish. We'll go through 11 through 26. And we'll, we'll, we'll highlight 14 and 15, but then we'll break it down to finish chapter 3. Um, won't finish it next week, I promise you that. <laughs> I can't believe I got this far tonight. Listen, I want to go back. I just want to repeat one thing because I think it's worth repeating. We got to understand. <clears throat> Luke is writing this book. And the experiences of what happened the day of Pentecost when Jesus told him to go tarry. And he's writing this book now to, uh, about the, the acts of, of how, the, how the life is living. You've heard me say that we're writing the next chapter. The book of Acts really didn't end here. It ends with us. We're, we're a continuation of Acts. Um, we're going to find out some things as we get deeper in this book that they met daily in homes and in the synagogue. And that if they didn't have a service where people were healed, delivered, baptized, and saved, then they didn't think they had church. Today we want to come in and have some songs and get out and make it to the buffet on time. God forbid if the Holy Spirit moves in our church, you're going to take up my time. Well, he's going to move here. I'm sorry to tell you, but he is. Here's what I want to repeat, because I think it's, perfect. If there's no gospel, there's no grace. If there's no grace, there's no Christ. If there's no Christ, there's no life. I mean, that could be a thing for our church, that we got to have the gospel so we can have grace. We got to have grace so we can have Christ. We got to have Christ so we can have life. No gospel, no grace, no Christ, no life. That might be a good t-shirt, too. I'm going to have all kind of new clothes here coming up. No, I'm not. I'm not. I am going to do another shirt. I was talking to somebody about it. Um, I've already talked to a guy to uh, talk to a company that gave me some pricing um, on it here local, uh, but if anybody else does shirts, um, I may talk to them too. <laughs> but uh, he was a little pricey, not too bad. But, but another shirt I'm going to do, and I, I got to make sure I'm not stealing the, the, log, the, the slogan because if I don't want to b- steal somebody else. But I think it's universal. I think anybody can use it. But I'm going to do another shirt that says, normal is not coming back. Jesus is. And I'm going to probably do it front and then have that on the back. I don't know. I'm just, I'm playing around. I'm looking at stuff. I'm typing stuff on a piece of paper, looking at it. I'm like, I'm, gonna, I'm not a t-shirt designer, y'all. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I just think I like it. Especially the whosoever. I'm doing that. I'm, do, I'm a whosoever. Because the Bible says, whosoever calls to the Lord shall be saved. We got to quit trying to figure out who we want to be, whosoever's. Churches amaze me when they want to go out and witness. They want to go to the country club. Nobody wants to go to their tracks. Nobody wants to go to the homeless. Nobody wants to go to the drug lanes. There's people in this community that done everything they could to survive last Thursday because they didn't have shelter in the first place. What has anybody said about them? 
I'm not, I'm not belittling what anybody went through. Please hear my heart. There's people still without power. But what about those people living under a tree? What happened? What did they do? Where'd they go? What have we done for them? Somebody told me Salvation Army opened up and let some people in. I don't know if that's true or not. I hope it is. I hope it is. But I'm just saying, we, we want to go to areas that, well, ooh, look what they drive. Let's go knock on their door instead of going to somebody who don't even have a car. I, I should, I might, should I say it, Deb? I'm not going to tell you who, where, when. And it was not directly said to me. It was said in a conversation with others. But the statement was made by a pastor of a church. If they can't tithe, what purpose do they need in my church? So I just kind of backed out of the circle and walked over here and said, um, can we take his credentials and fire him immediately? Yeah. To myself. It wasn't, it wasn't even our denomination. It wasn't even part of our movement. But, um, but I, you know, for somebody to be call themselves a shepherd and you're winning souls, if they can't tithe, then why do they need to be in my church? Why do you need to be behind a pulpit preaching to them people? I've made this statement to some to one Sunday morning. I made this statement years ago, and I actually offended somebody. And I had and I didn't repent. I did not tell them I was sorry. Because I mean it. I'd rather lose your friendship and tell you the truth than have your friend and see you go to hell. I said that statement and it offended them. So you don't want to be my friend. I said, Just, you're misreading what I said. Well, you said you'd rather, you'd rather lose me as a friend. and tell, I said, yeah, and tell you the truth than to be your friend and watch you go to hell because I'm not much of a friend if I let you go to that place. They wanted to see what they wanted to see, right? And I, and I feel that way. If, if somebody, you know, my, my former pastor told me one time, he said, Jeff, when you start pastoring, you're going to have to understand some things. You're not going to please everybody every time. And people are going to do what they want to do. Those two things you need to remember. Remember this. I said, okay. He said, you got to remember that the truth will make you free. I said, I know that. He goes, not everybody, not everybody wants to be free. So if you preach truth, you're going to offend them. And I said, well, I hate that. Because all I have to do, I'm responsible for preaching this book. And if it's not truth, I'm accountable. So, if you don't want truth, don't come. <laughs> come anyway. Come anyway. Put plugs in your ear. I'll just make sure they're hollow so they'll still go sitting there and... <laughs> I'll hollow them out so when you put them in, you're still going to hear everything. Listen, listen. These guys didn't preach a sermon when they walked into this gate. They didn't go get the worship instruments out and have a worship service. And I'm not knocking those things. Those things are important. Some people say this, well, I didn't even, pastor was like, I didn't even get to preach today. And somebody's like, well, that's not right. You got to have the word every week. Listen, if the Holy Spirit's moving through worship, and he's pre I don't need to minister. You don't need to hear my voice. You need to let, get in touch with him and let him do what he's doing. Amen. And I, I said, but it, it's not. We, we, we try to make it too traditional. You know, let God come in. Let God have his way. We'll preach truth and, 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 and let the truth do what it does. It's not me up here condemning anybody. And my, my, my thinking has always been, if I preach something from this book, and you're reading it with me, and you're agreeing with me, and you're saying amen, yeah, preacher, keep on, and you're getting excited, and you're happy, and it offends somebody, it wasn't me that offended you, it was the Word of God. And so, so that situation kind of turns to a different point. 
You don't come to me about it. You go to him about it because he wrote it. <laughs> I'm just quoting it. And I tell people, if you've got a problem with the Bible, talk to the author. Don't come to the pastor blasting him for it. I had somebody tell me one day, Pastor, I just, I'm going to have to leave the church. And I'm like, really? I'm sorry. What, what happened? So, well, you know, Pastor, you're doing great with the people, but I'm just not getting fed. And I said, well, all I can do is make the table. I can't make you eat. Do you know they stayed? <laughs> they actually stayed? And I said, well, I guess he's going to eat a little bit now. But listen, it, it's, it's, it's the gospel. It's Christ. It's him crucified. It's him resurrected. Jesus said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. And it may not be an abundant life on this earth. You may not have all the things you desire in your heart or, or that you want. You may have the desires of your heart because he said he'd give them to you. But you may not, you may not have be the wealthiest. You may not be the, have the best thing, the best of this, the best of that. But I'm here to tell you something. When it's all said and done and you stand before him and he says, well done, Summer, my good and faithful servant, you just got an abundant life that you can't even measure up to. It may not be here. It may be up there. But the journey on the way is pretty fun. Amen? Let's stand. All right, I owe y'all three minutes because I went over three minutes. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it, it rebukes, it corrects, it lifts, it encourages. But Lord, we... We must, have, we must have the gospel. We must have grace. We must have Christ. Because without them, we, we, have, we have nothing. And Lord, help us today. Help us as we leave this place and help us as we endeavor the days of the rest of this week. That you're with us. You, you're, you're, you're guiding and you're leading. And Lord, you're speaking. We're all vessels that want to be used for your glory. And God, help us today. Help us, as Lord, continue to touch those that are working in our community, the, the, the power companies, the, the volunteers that came, the, the, the local citizens in the community that are working. Just, Lord, those that are still, still in, in just in turmoil over their houses or vehicles or, or what, things they've lost. And, Lord, I, I just pray you just give them peace and let them know you're with them. And Father, we thank you, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I've told some of you, some of you don't know, but Brother Dennis Tanner was a, never really joined our church, but he was a good, a good regular, one of our tenders, and uh, he passed away Monday, 91 years old. He passed away Monday, um, his, his, bear, his viewing is Friday from 6 to 8 at Williams Westbury in Barnesville. I'm not sure exactly where that is, but you can probably find it. Uh, the viewing is 6 to 8. F Saturday is the funeral at the chapel at the same funeral home. Then they're going to have a burial here in Jonesboro. I'm sorry, in Jonesboro. Um, I've talked to Pam, I mean to Tammy and to Betty about doing food. I know, ladies, you got y'all will be occupied Saturday at the conference. But Tammy said if you can make something and bring it by the church Friday, put it in the fridge, she'll be here Saturday to warm it up. So anybody that can help contribute, whatever. Um, that would be great. And I still don't know for sure. I'll let everybody know tomorrow. I've got to call the family and see. At one time they wanted it, but I don't know about now. So, But I'll let everybody know. But if you're interested, uh, it's Williams Westbury. Uh, I think that's the guy that was with Mike Connor. And it, it used to be Connor Westbury. I think that's the Westbury down there, I think. But anyway, um, so... All of you that, that want to or can if you want to. Um, ladies, be here. Deb, Deb wants to be at Pike County at 8.30. Registration is at 8.30. You don't have to be there to register. She can register you there. But if you want to be there, be there about between 9 and 9.30. It starts at 10. They're going to have like coffee, donuts, and stuff before it starts. Um, and then from 10 to, I think, 12, 
is service, and then 2, 12.30 to 2, I think, is lunch, and then they're going to have breakout sessions from 2.30 or 2 to 3.45, and then uh, the next service the next service starts back at 4. So, um, so if you want to drive, it's at Pike Assembly. Go straight out Highway 19, going toward Thomaston, and you'll see it on the left. Once you go through Zebulon, keep going. It'll be on the left-hand side. Uh, yep, yep. So um, if you go to the Baptist church, you're going to miss the conference because they're not having one. So, uh, so anyway, um, keep that in mind, um, and we'll see you Sunday. God bless.